much. It's good to see so many people here. As was mentioned, I've just written a book called The Gendered Brain. And it was really to try, or the beginning, the end perhaps, of a, of a mission to try and understand how brains get to be different. I wasn't initially interested in this very old question about whether we have male brains and female brains. I really believe that every brain is different from every other brain. And in fact, I did want to call the book Fifty Shades of Grey Matter, but uh, <laughs> publishers felt that that was perhaps lacking in gravitas. Um, but really what I was then got to look at was this is a well-established difference between brains. Let's have a look and look at the research to see um, where the research findings led us, how they came to this conclusion. Um, and I was also involved very much in the idea of looking at how neuroimaging neuroscience as an emerging discipline, which I was involved in, was used to, um, to ask this question. So moving on, I just put this up briefly to establish my credentials. <laughs> um, I mainly do uh, brain imaging. I particularly use um, magnetoencephalography, which is this particular system here, um, as a way of looking at the connection between brain and behavior. Um, as was mentioned, particularly in developmental disorders, but then more recently looking at gender differences and really looking at how we might measure differences because we sometimes need to go right back to the beginning and say, if we think there's a difference, let's find a good way of looking at it. So we have the sort of standard techniques, um, fMRI, which of course you're all familiar with, and most of the work I'll be talking about is about fMRI. And as I will mention briefly, um, somewhat tentatively, given the, uh, the company, I think perhaps the use of fMRI is the cause of some of the problems um, that we encounter in looking at, at sex differences in the brain. And also the obviously a very old picture of me with a then very small daughter discovering the dangers of having a mother as a neuroscientist. Um, <laughs> but what we managed to produce were all of these images, and I will come back to that because they could be part of the solution, but sometimes they're part of the problem. This is a very old question, nearly 200 years. It didn't used to be a question, actually. It was a statement. Uh, the idea was that clearly men and women were different, and in particular, as we can see from a statement of one of the objective uh, male, I'm afraid, scientists who set off on this quest, uh, women represent the most inferior forms of human evolution and are closer to children and savages than to an adult civilised man. Uh, so this was a scientist view of the participants he was looking at. Slightly upgraded uh, in the next century, start with the realisation that as much as women want to be good scientists or engineers, they want first and foremost to be womanly companions of men and to be good mothers. So there was a very clear idea about the participants that these researchers were looking at. Uh, first of all, that they were inferior, and then slightly more politely, that they did have different skills which were, were complementary to the, the superior men. So that's one issue, the view that we take. The other issue is the kind of metrics that we used, because as we'll see shortly, there's lots and lots of very well-entrenched beliefs in the brain basis of sex differences, which were established before we could even look at the brain. So let's not worry about evidence. Let's actually come up with a theory, the assertion uh, that male brains are different from female brains, and this has all sorts of downstream consequences. So there's a wonderful array of techniques used, um, em filling uh, empty skulls with birdseed and weighing it, feeling bumps on the skulls, looking at what different ways of measuring the skulls. This particular one, craniology, is amazing, looking at all the different angles between earlobes and ends of the nose and forehead, etc. Any way in which they could find a way of devising a measure of the brain. And how did they decide if it was the right metric? They decided it was the right metric if it came up with the right answer. And the right answer was that at the top of any scale that was generated, and this did intersect with other issues, were white, male, upper-class, educated human beings. A bit further down, quite a lot further down, there were white women and children. Then a bit further down, there was uh, lower classes. And then even further down, there were other races. And if any metric they devised actually put women above men, for example, then clearly there was something wrong with the metric. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that the kind of excitement about, for example, that on average, uh, male brains are five ounces heavier than female brains, 
generated a lot of excitement because that seemed to be the answer. Um, male brains were superior because they were bigger, because size matters is the kind of issue that affects a lot of <laughs> debate in this area. Okay, so bear in mind that that's where, where the, where the uh, crusade, as I call it, sometimes started. The fact that there was no question that there were differences. It was really how we might use uh, particular types of techniques to, to, to measure them. Okay, the chain of argument that emerged, um, and what I've called here is how sex, to be, sex gets to be gender and causes gaps, and that's an issue we might come back to, was very straightforward. Whatever it was, and bearing in mind with the um, early scientists that they didn't actually have access to the concept of a genotype, for example, whatever it was that made male and female anatomy different, um, and it has always been acknowledged that male and ana female anatomy are different, that also determined that the owner of that brain, uh, uh, owner of that body had a different brain. So if you had a female anatomy, you got a female brain, male anatomy, you got a male brain. A bit later on, psychologists weighed in and produced a handy go-to list differentiating males and females. So if you had a female brain, that meant you were good at empathy-type things and uh, emotion, but rubbish at reading maps, and of course good at multitasking. Um, if you were, had a male brain, then you were brilliant at sort of science-type thinking, spatial cognition, um, good at reading maps, of course, but very bad at understanding emotions and listening. And that then gave you particular roles in society. If you had these kind of skills, you were good at being a, a, a nurse or a, a primary school teacher. Um, whereas if you had these kind of skills, you were going to be a, a genius scientist or a genius explorer or any kind of genius at the top of whatever tree that you wanted to measure. So clearly we had a very good idea um, that this difference here led to differences in behavior, which led to these kind of gender gaps. And a lot of the talk that I give is about the fact we are looking at gender gaps. This is not just an argument about anatomy, although anatomy does get involved. It's an argument about where these kind of gaps come from. And that's because there's a particular way of thinking about them, which we may need to revisit. These links here are all biologically determined and fixed, and in this direction. Bearing in mind that the old scientists right at the beginning, thinking about women being inferior, looked at the status quo and said, women are clearly inferior, look at their position in society, we need to explain how the brain supports that status quo. So the argument really came from that end, but it's always in this direction. So we have a fairly unidirectional argument which has been established. Behind all of this is the idea that biology is destiny, is, is, is a popular way of describing it. The idea is that there is some kind of unfolding of a predetermined biological script which comes to an inevitable end point. So biology is destiny, so we start, um, a little brain starts its, its life's journey, and I've depicted them here as slightly different. Again, we might come back to that. So a little boy brain arrives, perhaps already with some of the skills that might be necessary for his genius future. Um, then it gets slightly larger, acquiring more skills on the way, because, of course, he is exposed to whatever education uh, can be made available, um, eventually becomes very resilient, and lands up with a kind of male brain, because this is the end of a, 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 a biological script producing a male brain who will win Nobel Prizes, lead the world, um, whatever else it was that felt that human males uh, succeeded in. Whereas the female brain, which I've cheekily coloured a little light pink, um, arrives in the world possibly without some of those skills, actually, as it got bigger, didn't necessarily acquire any more. Um, not in any way linked, of course, to the fact that in um, certainly the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, um, those fragile little female brains weren't exposed to higher education because um, they would likely be damaged by those kind of, of, of exposures, um, and that would affect their reproductive system, etc. So... And there was indeed a condition called anorexia scholastica, um, which was uh, the dangers that would accrue if you exposed women's brains to higher education. So at the end product of this, you get these kind of, uh, which I've cheekily coloured, again pink with the sort of princessy meme, um, the idea that you got a brain which had a very different set of skills, a um, bit emotional, but that meant they were good at understanding emotion and, and networking, etc. So a very clear difference. Um, 
Male brains produced in one way, females produced in another, inevitable, fixed, um, and then moves on, as we shall see, to the idea that, you know, the owner of these brains is so different that they might come from different planets, the old Mars-Venus story, which we will come back to. So it's important there is what's called an essentialist pathway. This is something that's biologically determined that you can't change. And that was because of particular beliefs about the brain. The brain was internally um, devised, and uh, once it arrived at its developmental endpoint, it didn't change. Luckily, I think, for this debate, uh, we don't think about that too much anymore. So all of these were actually, these theories, these beliefs were established before uh, we could actually look at the intact living human brain with an intact living human being carrying out a, a task, albeit in a scanner. Um, so we then thought, well, once imaging arrived at the, um, end of the beginning of the 1990s, maybe at that point we could take a step back and say, Let's have a proper look at the brain. Let's use these amazing techniques, the kind of techniques where you can look at the, the, the structures of the brain, or you can look at pathways in the brain, or with MEG, for example, you can look at combination of the two. So you really got a good idea of what's going on in the brain. So let's take a step back and, and revisit uh, the theories that we believe in. But unfortunately, what happened was the hunt the difference agenda had really established itself in terms of people believing very powerfully in the differences between male and female brains. One of the first things that happened was that these brain images became so attractive and seemed so transparent. At last, the invisible has been made visible, and we can really see what's going on in the brain. Thence arrived a whole load of self-help books where people were intrigued with the idea that the particular stories they've been telling about differences between males and female brains at last had some kind of sciencey spin. So you've got lots of the books that hijacked these kind of images without any kind of explanation about how you got them, but it told a really good story. Um, and you get these books, for example, uh, Why Men Don't Listen, Women Can't Read Maps, uh, why men are clams, women are crowbars, intriguing um, dichotomy there. Um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So still selling the idea of a, a sort of binary divide between males and females based on their, on their brains. I'll come back with my opinion of that later. There were other sorts of books um, which were... Uh, the output of much more serious science, which actually were written by individuals who used brain imaging techniques, but were still of the mind that this was a difference that we needed to support. And there's a book called The Essential Difference by Simon Baron Cohen, which I think uh, characterizes nicely. The term, the essential difference, I think is interesting. Essential really means biological essence. So there is the idea that there's some kind of difference between males and females, determined biology. But I would have thought if I said to anybody in the room, um, except those of you who know, know the argument I make and have heard it before, if you heard the word essential, you'd think this is really, really important. This is something that we have to have. The opening lines of this book, the female brain, so there is such a thing, is hardwired, and that's an important concept to hang on to, because the idea was that this was somehow fixed for empathy. The male brain is hardwired for understanding systems. So again, a clear idea that um, there were two different types of brains with two different sorts of reasons for existing. But you say, well, OK, so there were people writing books. Maybe there were conclusions being drawn by people who had a, a very firm agenda. But let's have a look at the research papers. Let's, let's go and have a look and see what kind of research was actually being done. And if, if you did that, you'd find, first of all, hundreds, very rapidly, hundreds and then thousands of papers, which in the title had things like um, sex differences in the structural connectome of the human brain, sex differences in the adult human brain, and this one, the multifaceted origin of sex differences in the brain. So the scientific community seemed to be coming up with an agreement. And very often, these kind of um, papers um, were reported in the popular press generally with headlines like, at last, the truth, or proof at last. Almost as though, you know, we scientists had eventually caught up with what everybody knew all along, um, that men and women had different brains. But this is a key thing that I think it's worth drawing to attention because it remains true today. And it remains true of all sorts of areas, but something that is characterized well by looking at the research on sex differences. So 
papers would report sex differences in X. Uh, a male amygdala is bigger than a female amygdala, for example. Another paper would come along, um, equally well organized and, and, and sound methodology, maybe a big data set, and say, actually, we didn't find a, a difference in the amygdala in males and females, but we did find a difference in the hippocampus. And gradually, as you go through these data sets, you can see that there is an eagerness to find a difference, and a difference is found, but it's not always the same difference. The other thing to draw your attention to is that um, sometimes the authors themselves become rather over-enthusiastic in how they describe their particular findings. And this is a paper um, which has received a lot of attention with people criticising this approach to neuroscience. So I won't go into it in detail. It was one of the first papers that looked at um, connecting pathways within the brain rather than different structures. Because a lot of the focus of all of the research, particularly because fMRI was used, was really looking at structures. The argument was still there must be some kind of difference in some kind of structure that we can measure or quantify in a particular way which will explain gender gaps, male, female differences, etc. So this paper was the same sort of campaign, um, produced uh, connective pathways showing that there was much more powerful, significant pathways between the front and the back, the anterior, the posterior in the male brain, whereas much more um, firmly established pathways between the right and the left hemisphere in females. And all of this tied in nicely with kind of existing metaphors which had been used to describe the difference between male and female brains, such as in terms of, of right and left hemisphere differences. And the authors said, taken together, these results reveal fundamental sex differences in the structural architecture of the human brain. Fundamental, so, you know, really powerful. But then people started looking at it and say there were many more, thousands more comparisons were made in this data set, and all that's been reported is something like 134, where the differences were statistically significant. And the other thing to draw your attention to is the nature of those differences. And that particular graph, in fact, if you took nothing away from this evening, it's that's the kind of data we're looking at when we're talking about sex differences. Take uh, males and females, run them through any task you like, look at particular structures in the brain, and you'll find a huge amount of variability within each population. If you put the data sets on the same axis, you'll see that the differences between them are very often very tiny much smaller than the differences within the groups, which, as an autism researcher, is something I'm much more interested in. So it did puzzle me that we're spending a lot of time looking at these little differences. As it happens in this paper, these were the biggest differences that were reported in these pathways. So these fundamental sex differences are actually very small, and knowing that your participant is male or female is not going to tell you much about where they're going to come in those particular data sets. And that's the conclusion that we have to bear in mind today, I have to say, um, you know, having spent a lot of taxpayers' dollars on neuroimaging studies. We can't say that there's any one part of the brain or set of pathways in the brain or, or network in the brain which reliably distinguishes a male brain from a female brain. I couldn't look at a brain image and say, right, that's a man, that's a man, that's a female. I couldn't look at any of you and put you in my scanner and say, I know what your brain's going to look like because you're a female. I know what your brain's going to look like because you're a male. So I think, again, that's something really important because we have this fixed idea that there's two types of brains, a male brain, a female brain, nicely distinct, uh, nicely separate, just the binary, the two categories. And neuroscience really doesn't bear that up. And if you, if you look at when people, particularly in, in popular communication, say uh, decades of neuroscience has shown, uh, that's when I start shouting at the radio or throwing the newspaper across. No, it hasn't. It would be great if it did. And I do think that we're not looking, I'm not denying that there are sex differences. I've been known, uh, being called a, a sex difference denier, uh, one of the more polite things that um, uh, have been described as. Um, I do believe that there are sex differences between the brain. I think the problem is, that A, that we've been possibly looking in the wrong place and, dare I say it, possibly using the wrong type of techniques. Because I think science, is, science imaging has painted itself into a corner by focusing on structures as opposed to much more, perhaps, transient functions and changes in, in, in different parts of brain activity. So I think there are sex differences but I don't think we've found them yet, so we can't make the kind of claims that are being made. 
And I think we need to say, maybe we've been, A, using the wrong techniques, asking the wrong questions, and maybe we're looking in the wrong place because we're focusing so much on what goes on inside the brain. Nobody seems to pay too much attention to what's going on outside the brain. And that was really what I was trying to do with the book, to say, let's have a look and see. Um, oh, I just, just to really stir things up a bit. Um, <laughs> labelled these as, and that's thanks to Cordelia, who's somewhere in the audience, um, coining the term neurosexism. Um, and neurohype, I think, is, is, is a lot of that. So I may feel, feel that I'm um, being unkind to, to, to neuroscience as a whole. But I think because this is a very important question for reasons that you may already be aware of, but that I'll come back to, we need to look at neuroscience very carefully. We need to look at the methods. We need to look at the interpretations that the scientists make. And this is really why I, I wrote the book. And I have to say it wasn't a, a, a supposedly critical acclaim. It's not always been well received because there is this at last the truth, proof at last out there where people don't like somebody rocking the boat. So the Daily Telegraph, which is a serious newspaper in the <laughs> UK, Christina Rodoni said uh, what I said um, smacked of feminism with an equality fetish. So I kind of like the idea that, you know, if you're interested in equality, it's some kind of perverse practice. Um, and the Daily Mail also said I was full of carp, which I think is a spelling mistake, if you th <laughs> think about that. Anyway, so. Okay. Okay. So having dished, you know, 200 years of research and uh, most of the early stages of neuroimaging, do I think that neuroscience has got anything to say about this particular story? The answer is, you'll be pleased to hear, yes. And that's because there are different ways of thinking about the brain and saying maybe thinking about the brain in these ways would be more informative to try and understand the differences we're interested in. So has the brain got any um, new concepts? Or has, has neuroscience got any new concepts which should say this may be a better way of thinking, of framing the question about gender gaps? about male and female brains, whether or not we should still be thinking in those terms. First of all, the idea is um, we've always focused, neuroscientists, in, in, in understanding the human brain on the amazing skills we have, the cognitive skills, the fact that um, we could be mathematicians or scientists or philosophers or artists or poets. But it's emerging that one of the most important skills that our brain gives us is to make us social to make us part of many more social networks than any other species, much larger social networks. And part of that, and this is the sort of work that, that um, neuroscientists like me have been carrying out, is looking at the way in which we establish uh, social constructs, the way in which we fit into a world, the way in which we interact with other people. So we're not looking at what the brain does inside, we're looking at how the brain interacts with what's going on outside. So we have a sense of self, um, give somebody a list of, of adjectives which best describe you, or can see the activation in, in certain parts of the brain, a sense of others, uh, what do you think about your colleagues, for example, and you have a list of adjectives, quite interesting watching parts of the brain activated with those. You have a, a sense of belonging, describe the groups that you associate with and, and what, how do you think they behave and, and how do you fit in, and a whole... Uh, list of understanding the social scripts and social norms which make us part of our outside world, how we interact with other people. And part of that is understanding stereotypes. And you can actually find quite nicely that stereotypes are strangely stored slightly differently from sort of everyday semantics. So that may also be another reason, as we'll come back to, why they're very difficult to, to unpick. So our brain will make us social. Anything we do um, will, as with any activity in the brain, however you know, superior we feel we are evolutionary, we are still very much um, driven by our emotions. So things that have a good outcome will make us feel good. Things that have a bad outcome, socially rejected, for example, will make us feel bad. And that will feed into our system in the brain, which is part of the brain called the anterior cingulate, which is where I spent a lot of my imaging years, which I'm... Uh, depicted here is like a traffic light system or a, um, uh, a railway point system. This is a very powerful control system in the brain. It particularly keeps an eye on emotional responses. And anything negative, that part of the brain will try and shut that behavior down. So it's quite a powerful inhibitor or an inner limiter if you're into lorry drivers or, or cars, for example. So we do have a part of our brain which will shut down behavior, which doesn't, for example, if we talk about social behavior, which leads to mistakes 
or where it's felt that we're not following the social script appropriately. The other thing that we need to remember is that this all starts very, very early. And people sometimes ask me what, you know, what most surprised you when you did the research for the book or new things that you found out. And that was how amazing babies are. Human babies are really amazing. We always used to think that because human babies are dependent and helpless for much longer than the young of any other species. We used to think about them um, rather patronizingly as, as subcortical, for example, because they couldn't speak, they couldn't move, you had to look after them. But we now know that human babies arrive in this world with the most finely tuned set of social radar you've ever seen. Right from the beginning, they are picking up the cues in the outside world that will make them uh, behave appropriately, belong into a social network, which of course is how they're going to survive. So within hours, they're picking up uh, a human face as opposed to scramble images or face-like stimuli. Um, within days, they can tell the difference between um, their own native language and another language. And there's a lovely study where uh, the way in which you can tell if a baby is, a very small baby is paying attention is you give them a, a pacifier. And if they're interested, they su suck harder on the pacifier. So you can see this baby getting really excited by the sound of English and a little puzzled by Dutch and French and Japanese. So these are, you know, several days old babies already telling differences between kind of social communication uh, signs out there. So we now know we have a social brain and therefore we need to understand how that might affect our behavior and how that might again address this issue of how brains get to be different and why people behave differently so profoundly apparently that we really believe that they are again, almost from a different planet. And this is where we bring, I bring you to the sort of core um, sciencey bit of the explanation. And that's the fact that each of these Ps represent new ways of thinking about the brain that have really arrived in the 21st century. And they're really a lot to do with the fact that our brain is not just a kind of autonomous information processing system, it's a social brain. And it's a brain which is paying attention to the experiences available and the attitudes and expectations in the outside world. The first P is our brains are predictive coders, okay? Um, which is a science way of saying that our brains are like a mixture of sat-navs and predictive textures. Our brains don't just respond to information, they're not just reactive to information coming in. They're actually out in the outside world making up the rules so that we, it'll say, when you hear that sound or see that sight, for example, this is what normally happens, don't spend too much time processing it, move on, next. And that allows us to move through the world relatively smoothly. Um, occasionally makes mistakes, which is why you get visual illusions, for example, when a brain thinks, oh, that means there's a triangle there, uh, and actually there isn't, but there normally is. So it might be a bit scary to think we're being driven around the world by a predictive coder or a sat-nav, but it generally manages quite well. The reason I got drawn into this was very much to do with the work with autism, where individuals on the spectrum do have a lot of trouble with decoding social signals. And the basis of this may be that they don't find the world predictable, socially predictable, maybe even sensorily predictable. And the kind of work we've been doing uh, with colleagues, one of whom is, is depicted here, um, is looking at this sort of backwards and forwards and backwards information where some information arrives, a prediction is made, expect this, something happens, did that work? Yes, great, carry on. Did it not work? Oh, right, well, we need to change our expectation. So the world is constantly out there looking at rules. And that applies to social rules as well. Is this person waving to me or are they about to slap me around the face? Those of you who know my colleague uh, may know this is an ambiguous sort of statement. Um, but what you need to do is actually look at the context and say, you know, what else is going on in the world? And if you don't have the appropriate predictions available for you, then the world becomes a very frightening place and the kind of social cues you expect um, aren't available. So the, the, the brain is making up, you know, finding out social rules for us. The other thing is, and, and I know this is known well to, to, to many people here, is that our brains are plastic. Our brains are constantly flexible and changeable throughout our lives. And anything we do, experiences we have, will change them. And you think, 
well, of course, that must be the case. But remember that the theory we were looking at earlier suggested that there was a kind of developmental endpoint of the biological script that was unfolding. That once you reached a certain age, used to be sort of quite early teens, maybe moved on a bit later now, this was the brain that was going to carry you through the rest of your life until you get to that particularly unfortunate cognitive cliff where the grey cells start disappearing and you start forgetting things. Um, but what that this actually showed was that any experience we have will continue to change the brain throughout our lives. And the classic studies used um, are, for example, the taxi drivers in London have to do an amazing uh, feat of visuospatial memory. They have to memorise and be able to use the 20,000 routes within six miles of Charing Cross um, to the extent that uh, they can, anybody gets in their cab anywhere in London, they can know how to get there their fare to the, to, the, um, to the destination most efficiently. Hugely complicated, takes about three or four years on average, sometimes as long as six or seven years, lots of people fail. But what's interesting is that um, the series of studies actually tracked taxi drivers before they started the knowledge. Then they looked at what happened once they'd acquired it and were being taxi drivers. And interestingly, what happened once they retired? And they found there were particular parts of the brain which did change as they acquired the knowledge, which became larger. Patterns of activation associated with them became larger. But interesting, once they stopped being a taxi driver, those differences disappear. So I think this is a nice way of demonstrating that the experiences we have are reflected in the brain. And the brain changes, wax, waxes and wanes according to whether those experiences are current um, or, or whether they're in, in the past. Past. And so, of course, that means that uh, if our world offers us certain kinds of experiences, then we'll get a certain kind of brain. If it doesn't offer us those experiences, then we'll get a different kind of brain. And it may be that that we're looking at rather than the origins of the brain itself. And what I'm illustrating here is this uh, reference to a particular kind of thinking called the spatial cognition tasks, where uh, this is a mental rotation test, which is a very good measure, al allegedly, of spatial awareness, spatial manipulation, spatial processing. Allegedly, again, one of the most robust differences between males and females, hence the kind of map reading trope that we have, and the basis of why men are much better at doing science than girls, because they've got the right sort of brain. Big study done looking at spatial cognition in males and females in the States four years ago now. Um, demonstrated with a whole array of spatial tasks that, yes, on average, again overlapping, but on average, males scored um, higher than females. But then the researchers actually said to the uh, participants, could you tell me about the kind of toys you played with as a child? Were they construction toys? What kind of hobbies do you have? What kind of games do you play? Is there a spatial element? What, what is your occupation? And they found that once they introduced this spatial training opportunity or spatial experience measure, the sex differences disappeared. So what you were actually looking at was the result of some kind of training opportunity, which had been available from very early, if you were talking about toys. And this brings us to the idea that perhaps some of the differences we're looking at, which appear early or appear so fixed, may be more to do with what's going on outside the brain as well as what's inside the brain. If you don't have the experiences, your brain doesn't show that. And there are some interesting studies showing that at brain level. This is actually um, an image of, of girls um, playing Tetris intensively for three months. Girls who were having trouble with spatial skills uh, playing Tetris. Um, and this at the end is those parts of the brain which changed. This was before uh, they played Tetris before the practice and this was at the end. And these were the changes. So there were structural and functional changes in the brain which actually um, uh, monitored the, the training opportunities these individuals had had. So again, and this is a, a, a pattern from a Lego book, a Lego instruction manual, which is, I think, pretty similar to some of the mental rotation tasks. So people who play more with Lego are going to be better at spatial cognition. Is it the Lego or is it the XY chromosome? Moving on then, um, the other sort of final P is the fact that our brains are permeable. So that actually... Um, our brains don't just solve problems autonomously. You give it a problem and it's brilliant at solving it, but whatever the context, it will solve the problem in the same way. 
And this is a reference to um, a particular process, social psychology process called stereotype threat, where if you draw attention to the fact that you know, somebody's a, a member of a minority group who has a reputation for not being good at a certain task, you give them the task, surprise, surprise, they tend to underperform on that task. And this is demonstrated at both the behavioral and the brain level. This was a study where three different groups of women were given um, uh, a mental rotation task, a spatial task. One group were given a positive message. This is a task that women are very good at. I'm going to see what happens when I put you in the scanner. Another group had a neutral message. Third group, this is a group um, which, um, this is a task which women are actually um, poor at, and, and you'll struggle a bit, but never mind, I want to see what happens in the scanner. I'm losing track of which message I got. One group got positive, one group got negative. And what was interesting is the errors they made reflected that, so the ones with a positive message um, actually made many fewer errors, significantly fewer. The ones with a negative message made many more errors. But what was interesting is this was reflected at the brain level. So the women with a positive message, the appropriate areas of the brain were activated by the task and they solved it efficiently. Whereas the women with a negative message, they had much more activity associated with the error evaluate, that little traffic light system I showed you earlier, part of the brain, and the emotional centers. So exactly the same task, but the social context affected how the brain processed information. And these kind of changes are also shown, this is some work from my lab, I did, when I was putting this together, looking at the kind of strand of activity that informs this particular debate, realised that I spent quite a lot of time making people feel bad about themselves in the scanner, because I'm very interested in self-esteem, for example, and, and whether or not how you feel about yourself will change your, your brain and your behaviour in a particular way. So um, this kind of thing was, you know, lying in the scanner, think about the worst mistake you ever made, just think about it for a bit, how much was it really your fault, etc.? Um, and this was another one where you uh, have a, 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 a false um, video game, a rigged video game, where the person involved, there's a, a group of people throwing the ball to each other, your little cartoon figure arrives and they throw the ball to you, and then pretty soon they stop throwing the ball to you and have a great time and you're watching them. And I've done this task and you're lying in the scanner, I know this is a video game, but I am getting a bit pissed off with this. And you do, if you get measures of self-esteem, show that people, even though they know they're in the scanner, their self-esteem will take a dent. So this kind of social rejection or feeling of self-criticism does have quite a powerful message, a, a result in a quite powerful change in the brain. And what's interesting is that all of these kind of areas of activation which are associated with a feeling of, of social rejection or not being in the right place in the social hierarchy, the areas of the brain which change are the areas of the brain which are associated with real pain. So if you have somebody with chronic pain or some kind of broken leg or a colleague giving you an electric shock because they're trying out thresholds, we neurocognitive neuroscientists can be quite un unpleasant to each other. Possibly the person giving me the electric shock was the one I'd got to think about the worst mistake they'd ever made. <laughs> but effectively what you're saying is being social, a sense of belonging, being afraid of being rejected is a very powerful driver in the brain. And this is why I think it's relevant to trying to unpack this story about gender gaps and gender differences. Because you then have to say, okay, so the world is a brain influencer. We look at these brains which um, may arrive in the world with slightly different biological scripts, but we need to look outside the brain and we say, do we live in a stereotyped world? Well, I could stop there and we could all have a kind of mental muse of, of actually how stereotyped our world is. But just to give you an idea, and this is really, I spend quite a lot of time looking at how the world codes the differences between males and females very firmly. And I think it happens much more in the 21st century than it ever used to. Nothing for me signals the dire coding between boys and girls in the 21st century more than gender reveal parties. I don't know if gender reveal parties have reached Australia yet. Keep them out if you can. Um, what happens is now we have scanning techniques which 20 weeks into a pregnancy, so 20 weeks before a child even arrives, you can get a scan which gives you a pretty reliable indication of whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. Um, queue for a party, so you send out these ghastly invitations. I hope there's nobody organises gender reveal parties. <laughs> yeah. 
you send out these ghastly invitations. Is it going to be touchdowns or tutus, uh, rifles or ruffles? So you get the image. Okay, so you turn up at the party, and everything's disguised in either white or, or, or kind of some kind of neutral colour. You get a cake, which at some key moment you can cut open, and oh, it's pink or it's blue. You can release a whole load of balloons. Um, uh, you can have alligator biting into a, a football and pink or blue feathers released, you can get the picture. Uh, and I am sparing you the most recent thing I came across, which was a gender reveal lasagna. So you can actually <laughs> serve your guests a lasagna where the cheese sauce is dyed pink or blue. It is <laughs> disgusting. Okay. So, I mean, and people say, are you really saying that we're going to damage children's brains when, you know, by going to a gender reveal party? Of course not. What I'm saying is this is a really clear indication of how powerfully society decides that you're either one thing or another. You're either a male or a female. Here's uh, one or the other box to put you into. And then, of course, the other thing is, I hope there's no card manufacturers either, you get these ghastly, it's a boy, blue card with football, uh, it's a girl, hello to our new little princess, pink card, etc. So again, I'm not saying that because there's pink and blue balloons on cots and cards, this is, you know, irre irreparably damaging the child's brain, but it is a code. And it means people will respond differently to that child if there are pink or blue cards or, or whatever. And then that's very important as well. Because our world actually, a bit like I was saying with the stereotype threat, our world, our brains will respond to different attitudes and expectations. So not just experiences, but also how people expect you to do. So if they expect you to do something different because you're a girl or a boy, th that girl or boy brain will be picking it up. And we've also got toys, and I'll come on to that shortly. Um, we've got education, which is another source of a very clear stereotyping, which happens in the outside world. Um, and also, just briefly, a little rant about, as I was, uh, mentioned, I was very interested in the underrepresentation of women in science. So let's just quickly have a look at what's going on there. And this is this idea that toys might make a difference. And I've mentioned already the idea that we have this uh, sort of sex difference which um, uh, determines the difference between males and females and that it may be a result of, of, of some kind of um, experience. And if you look at the kind of toys which reliably differentiate uh, boys from girls in terms of the frequency with which they play with them, so we have Lego already mentioned, video games are an amazing source of spatial training. And I give talks in schools, I can see the teachers rolling their eyes when I say video games are really great for spatial training, but they are. But am I being unfair in saying that we don't have the same experiences or expectations, or girls and boys don't have the same experiences? Girls play with Lego. Well, what girls play with is Lego Friends, which is a slightly different version of Lego, not interesting constructions. You can have bigger blocks because you couldn't manage tricky bits. Um, and what you can do is you can make a hairdressing salon, for example. But this is my favourite. Um, this is STEM or Engineer Barbie. Um, so Mattel, being aware of the underrepresentation of women in science, was going to solve it by producing Engineer Barbie. Now, this is Engineer Barbie, a very short lab coat, even shorter miniskirt. It has got DNA patterns on to make it look sciencey, and <laughs> and she's holding a, a microscope, alarmingly high heels. But you know, perhaps I'm being picky. Do you know what STEM Barbie can make? She can make a pink washing machine or a pink jewellery carousel. I, I rest my case. I think toys are very important. I think they're a very important training opportunity, and I think girls and boys in the 21st century have, um, don't have the same opportunities. Education, much the same. I was part of a BBC programme called uh, No More Boys and Girls, Can Our Kids Go Gender Free? And that was really saying, if you go into any classroom, and this was a classroom of seven-year-olds, you will already find that the children in that classroom have quite clear views about um, who's good at what. Uh, little girls said, being a boy is better because you can grow up to be president, which I think is quite sad. Um, or, and if you give them games and say, how are you going to do on these games? And you get the girls to rate, you know, on a scale from 0 to 10, how well they'll do. And similarly, boys, the girls' self-esteem, how I'll do in this game is down 3 and 4. Boys are up 9, 10, you know, 11, if I could give it to them, etc. And all throughout education, there's is evidence that teachers overmark boys and undermark girls, and that has 
effects on their later choices. Six-year-old girls who to don't choose games because they've been to particular games because they've been told they're for really, really clever people, and girls aren't really, really clever people, so I won't play with that game. And nine-year-old girls saying that maths is a boy thing. And in the closing stages, just to, again, indicate why I think attitudes matter, and this is about the underrepresentation of women in science. And the idea very early on that women didn't have the right kind of brain, quite literally, they didn't have the right science brain. And a wonderful statement, the chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than woman can attain. So that was a nice um, positive message from one of the greatest scientists of all time, Charles Darwin. Um, and you could say, OK, we have moved on from there. You know, attitudes have changed. Women can do science. Of course they can. But isn't it strange that even though they're clearly very clever because they've got the same sort of schools, they, they seem to choose not to do science. Well, I think you could just brood quietly on this rogues gallery, um, males' views on whether or not women should or could do science. Uh, Larry Summers then president of Harvard, lack of availability of aptitude at the high end, and that's why you didn't get famous women mathematicians and engineers. James Damore, author of the Google Memo, effectively saying Google was wasting its time on diversity initiatives um, because the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ, in part, kindly, due to biological causes. And Alessandra Strumia, a physicist, saying the underrepresentation of women reflects sound scientific evidence of gender differences in interests. So that rogues gallery, you might say, well, you've got this very, very clever girl thinking, I might Actually, I might quite like to do science. And her social brain is saying, just look at the culture of that uh, organization to which you're heading. Um, you won't be, uh, there won't be other people like you. What you do won't be recognized or rewarded. If you do well, then it's because you worked really, really hard and not because you're, you're very clever. So I'm clearly characterizing it, but I think it's something that we need to think about. OK, so right at the end, then, come back to this sort of essentialist pathway, this unfolding of this inevitable biological script. I think we need to remember that brains reflect the lives they've lived, not just the sex of their owners. And maybe a lot of the issues that we've been confronted, confronting about men being different from women, uh, males being different uh, from females, is very much to do with the understanding that this is firmly entrenched in our belief. We see what we want to see, we have a confirmation bias. So, of course, at last, the truth, male, male and female brains are, are different and the scientists have caught up. I don't think that's the answer, because I think what we also need to be aware that this is a, is a biological script, um, but it's playing out on a social stage. And I think the social stage has a much greater impact on the brains than we ever realized. So the differences we're looking at may not be the differences between sexes uh, due to the kind of internal characteristics, but may be much more to do with the world in which they find themselves. And having shown you lots of, of, of brain images, this lovely little picture that a six-year-old came up with, which I think sums it all up. Um, so if anybody says to you, men's and women's brains are different, hopefully from now on you'll say, no, this is not the truth. Everybody's brain is attached to the world and everybody's brain is different from everybody else's. Thank you very much.